it's being passed. And thank you for joining us today. And this is a fourth uh, seminar on the East Asian hist Intellectual History Network. And uh, the today's, uh, today's speaker is Hai Jun Yun uh, from Yonsei University. So uh, he talked about, new titled, his book is titled Use as History, the Context of Edmund Burke's Historical Articles in the Annual Register, 1758-1764, and their rhetoric of contextualization. And the discussants are Sora Sato from Toyo University, Tokyo, and Bao Wei Tzu Eastern, from Eastern China University, at Eastern China Normal University, Shanghai, and Zhen Pi Zhang, Zhejiang University, Hansu. Uh, so I'm Shinji Nohara uh, from University of Tokyo. So, uh, uh, Dr. Hai Jun Yun, please uh, begin your uh, talk. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Nohara. It's a great, huge pleasure for me to be the first speaker in this new series sponsored by Tokyo University. I guess I was chosen because I'm the one of the older guys here. You're all obviously much younger than me. And in the East Asian Confucian culture, age does matter. But nonetheless, I mean, uh, there is very much me to learn from my younger colleagues here and I humbly present my recent work which uh, actually was a, a commissioned by a group of people whose specialty isn't primarily in the intellectual history because I mean uh, this book uh, this article would be a chapter in a book which would be called tentatively the role of content production and reception of historical news discourse. So my fellow contributors mostly come from language studies, they're historians of journalism, and they often use this big data corpus, whereas my data certainly is much smaller than theirs. Although reading some of five or six years of the annual register was no light labor, as, as Sora certainly would appreciate. And uh, the reading of uh, annual register itself, however, is something which I do recommend to those who are interested in 18th century studies because it is immensely rewarding. I mean, they contain a great deal of curious facts about the period. And they also tell us quite a lot about the, uh, the mentality, the mentalité of the age. Uh, because if intellectual history typically look as, at the production side of ideas, particularly coming from those leaders and exceptionally articulate thinkers, history of journalism and public publication uh, is interested in looking at how ideas are received, circulated, and utilized by the general reading public. And I guess, therefore, I mean, uh, intellectual history and history of journalism or publishing perhaps can collaborate in, in its own way, which is something perhaps I'm trying to suggest in my own way. Now, however, what I'll be talking about here uh, is really an extremely atypical book, almost a book before book, it's pre-political book, it's Burke, the man of letters, philosopher, historian, and journalist. And that Burke is something which Burke himself didn't really want to talk very much about in his later career. And I think that uh, that reservation is also reflected in Burke's studies and Burke's scholarship. Because uh, the Burke people are familiar with, or people either like or dislike, is the Burke, the philosopher in action, as he put it in his own uh, writing, in, which is really an exceptionally rare case of well, someone who is both a philosopher and a politician. <laughs> I think that's something we're all similar in our time, isn't it? Now, however, yet this other early book uh, may have value for us, particularly living in this hyper-politicized world where nothing is correct except that which is politically correct, as the saying goes, and where there is no justice but political justice. So we are living in a world where politics seems to be everything. Now, of course, the later book or book proper uh, invade against politics without principle. So there was always that uh, element of philosopher in Burke and uh, universal criteria of correct behavior and justice is what he passionately sought to uphold throughout his career, even to the very last years of his life. But in battling his enemies, Burke, the politician, that is the, the real Burke, exposed himself to battles, sustaining wounds and scars. Whereas the early Burke, whom I'll be looking at today, uh, is presents a more congenial, unperturbed, unruffled, perhaps more innocent complexion. 
So to apply his own distinction developed in his, in his philosophical inquiry into sublime and beautiful, the Burke I'll be looking at this evening resides in the domain of the beautiful, whereas the Burke that we are all familiar with would be uh, one belonging to the realm of sublime. So uh, I will now be reading my parts of my article, jumping certain parts, but to save time, I will be uh, sharing uh, the, I'll be putting the quotations directly on uh, the uh, slide so that uh, I will silently move the cursor and uh, you would know that I'll be uh, Okay, right. All right, so you, all right, so we all have our slides. So here we go. The annual register was a periodical published every year from 1759 to 1793, whose first editor was Edmund Burke. Uh, historians have found the annual register to be serviceable as a depository of reliable records. And it is remembered in studies of Burke's thought by my good colleague here, Sora, for instance. Yet as a whole, mentions of the annual register remain somewhat sparse, both in the history of journalism and in Burke's studies. In our time, few seem to accept Locke's, the great bi biographer of Burke, by the way, recommendation of the annual register as an eminently enjoyable work. But the reception of his contemporary readers was far from lukewarm. The annual register, published a few months after the year covered by each volume, could not possibly compete with the weeklies or monthlies in meeting the reading public's thirst for informative novelty. However, it had the advantage of hindsight and the leisure to provide a more comprehensive exegesis of current affairs, above all of the Seven Years' War, which was raging at the time. The annual register put the war in context, not just in the sense that it recontextualized or recycled the source material garnered from other publications, but also through its rhetorical performance. The history of the present war, which I'll just from now on is called history, the principal article of each volume, synthesized the events of the Seven Years' War into one connected narrative. The writer of the history, moreover, adopted the voice of an informed and impartial historian in presenting the contextualizing connections. I seek to do justice to what follows in what follows to the unsung merits of the history by focusing on its balanced rhetoric of contextualization. So first, the context of the annual register. And in April 1758, pressed with financial needs, Burke, as yet a relatively unknown Irishman in London, signed a contract with the publishing house of R. and J. Dodsley in Pall Mall to write, collect, and compile from such materials as may arise a work entitled The Annual Register or Retrospection on Men and Things for the Year 1758, to be printed in October. I put a quotation. The senior partner, Robert Dotsley, typified the enterprising spirit of the age, as is testified by his address at Pall Mall, close to the center of fashion and away from the traditional booksellers around St. Paul's Churchyard. Keenly aware of the monetary value of a successful periodical, he had tried his luck with two short-lived periodicals in the 1740s, which both have the word register in their titles. The register in the title of the annual register inherits Dotsley's previous ventures whose shabby sales figures he hoped to improve with the new annual magazine. For writing the history, as well as some of the volumes, uh, some of the book reviews, and taking charge of the editing, Burke received 100 pounds for each volume in two installments from 1758 to 1765. The payment, though not sumptuous, was more or less the market price, and the newly married Burke had the compelling need to secure a regular income. The publisher on his part had many reasons to congratulate himself. The annual register proved to be an instant success commercially, largely thanks to the creative energy the editor expended to compose the history, which became its trademark feature. Given the superb quality of Berg's historical accounts of the war, one scholar thought in 1957 that they deserve to be included in the canon of Berg's works. However, the editors of the standard collection the Clarendon edition of Burke's writings and speeches, refused admission to the annual register. They, they considered that the annual register belongs to the omissions of note, yet curtly added that its exclusion was owing to the dispute about authorship. This is disingenuous as there seems to be no, no reason to doubt Burke wrote the history. The contract with, with the Dotsley stipulated that he write the sheets forming the annual magazine. 
The leading authorities in Burke have generally assumed Burke to be the author of the historical articles, at least, although the attribution of the book reviews of the annual register to Burke tends to be a bit more cautious. Where their opinions diverge concerns the duration of Burke's involvement with the periodical. Some believe he nearly terminated his journalistic career after he entered parliament in 1765, while others believe Burke's relationship with the periodical was never fully severed. On our part, as we focus on the annual register volumes covering the Seven Years' War, which ended in 1763, we can safely bestow full authorship of the history on Burke. Now, the authorship issue, which the editors of Burke's work allude to, also involves the anonymity cloaking the writer of the history. Anonymous writing was a, and you can see that there is no indication of the author in the sign here, was a pervasive practice in 18th century journalism, but it was by no means confined to Grub Street or journalism. Most novels were published anonymously, and Burke's uh, inquiry into the sublime and the beautiful was published by the Dossleys without the author's name on the title page. What matters then is not so much the anonymity itself as the degree of authorial control of the text, which is bound to be weaker in periodicals than in books. One has to be cautious in taking the annual register as, uh, as Burke's statement of his personal views, for he was paid by his publisher not to expound his philosophy, but to please the general public and his uh, bookseller, his publisher, of course. This caveat guides us to examine the rhetorical features of the history without presuming to trace some embryonic features, the profiles of the great political thinker in the articles. When the annual register made its debut in 1759, a large share of the British print market was already taken up by competing periodicals who catered to the public taste for war news and for political controversy. Weekly journals either eulogized or criticized Britain's war policies, while the established monthly, such as the Gentleman's Magazine, kept a relatively neutral stance, though at times the articles could also be heavily political. The annual register could adopt an even more detached tone than the Gentleman's Magazine, given its unhurried publication schedule, even as it followed the monthlies in its overall editorial format and practice, uh, filling large portions of its pages by extracts from other periodicals, which is what the Gentleman's Magazine uh, was doing at the time have been doing for some, some decades already. So the annual register, apart from its leading narrative of the current war, included uh, these diverse genres, which you can see here. In terms of quantity, the history occupied only a small portion of each volume, and like the rest of the publication, was squeezed into two columns in small type. But its status as the representative piece of the annual register was indisputable. The monthly magazines did not usually allot a prominent place to their foreign news. The gentleman's magazine reserved a page or two for foreign affairs and foreign advices, next to prices of goods and so forth. The annual register, by contrast, dared to open its annual issues with a comprehensive history of the present war, which was a bold move that went beyond the pre prevailing habit of the periodical press. It also went further than the pamphlets or books dealing with the ongoing war, which generally kept a very narrow focus on particular incidents or aspects with identifiable political leanings. Comprehensive coverage of the war claiming to be a complete or general history appeared only when the war neared its end in 1763. Burke's history was the only real-time narrative of the war, which also sought to maintain a level of contextualization that the term history invites the reader to expect. The authoritative stature of Burke's works towering above other contemporary accounts of the war is attested by a plagiarism. <laughs> so it shows how important, how saleable how, depend how dependable it really was, an Irish plagiarism item. The task imposed on the writer of a history of the present war was by no means easy. He had to grapple with the contingencies of warfare as he endeavored to construct a larger historical context. And I jump a few lines there. The journalistic nature of his labor is admitted explicitly at the end of uh, the history in the first volume of the annual register. And you see the quotation here, uh, just skip that part. The daunting challenge offered by the mass of materials serves, however, to underscore the merits of the history. So he writes how he you know, has achieved a wonderful thing in his own way. And the disclaimer at the end belies the writer's ambition since the serial essay did name itself the history, although he says, I, I would not give the name of history to what I have written, but he, he did call it history of the present war. 
as such kept at bay the loose detached manner characteristic of news reports, thanks to its capacity to convert the war into a connected series of events. When the war finally came to an end, the last in the series of the history closed on a self-satisfied note celebrating its achievement of having produced an annual connected narrative of the events of the late most remarkable war from its commencement to its conclusion. While the writer still would not indulge his vanity by claiming for his work the importance and dignity of a just history, he unabashedly asserted that his articles were much superior in value to a collection of gazettes or a dry, unconnected chronological table. The key word, both when the series was commenced in 1759 and when it was concluded in 1763, uh, is connection, which can be construed as a synonym of contextualization. The first point to note about Burke's rhetoric of contextualization is the lengthening of the time frame of the present war to make the reader feel that the Seven Years' War uh, is being contextualized, right of the history having entered the war in media stress in 1759, inserts into its first member number a history proper of the transactions of the preceding years. Just as he promised to look farther back in time, he advises the reader to turn their eyes another way from the melancholy picture of the present warfare to review the steps by which this war came to involve the rest of the contending powers. The canvas of Berg's historical review can be stretched quite far back indeed. He returns on one occasion to the conclusion of the Thirty Years' War in 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia as a way of commenting on the controversy about the costly British support of Prussia, Berg binds the current war in Germany to the fate of the Protestant cause protected by the 17th century treaty of the so much font and bloodshed there, for quotation there. Helping Frederick II of Prussia hold his ground against the combined might of Austria, Russia and France has become all the more necessary, paradoxically due to Friedrich's success in crushing other Protestant powers in Germany, such as Saxony. While this surely would not convince the critics of British war policy, it does manage to associate the perils Pr Prussia faces with the Protestant cause, which no good Br British Protestant can ignore. A total revolution in the system of Europe cannot fail to affect adversely the interests of Britain so proud of the Protestant religion. Yet the preeminent essay of the annual register cannot afford to fill its pages with long lectures on continental history, since the history is a news article of sorts covering the, the present war. Major battles have to be depicted to, to gratify the reader's taste for robust action. Burke, Burke's depiction of military campaigns in the history is marked by masterly modulation of paratexts assisted by semicolons and tuned to the hectic rhythm of battles, as the sample here words demonstrate. Immediately after this vivid narration, however, the contextualizing tone of the writer is amplified when the reader is, is reminded that the business of the history is not to enter into the detail of all the various maneuvers of every battle. I, I skip a few lines there. Berg's history, although by no means deficient in detailed information, as can be seen in the figures in the quotation above, uh, takes care to provide an overview of the battle as in the following passages. And here are the two remaining quotations, and I, which I also skip. The offshot of a complex chain of maneuvers of vast armies is stated with, with refreshing succinct, succinctness with all the key factors and agents connected to the overall context. The whole war literally is taken in one view. The historian of an ongoing war, which was also truly global in its extent, had not only to move back in time, but also to fly back and forth between the different war theaters separated by immense distances. And all this before the age of uh, telegraph or, or internet. To strengthen the feeling that the war is being contextualized, Burke had to find some expressions linking one theater to another. A slothful option would be simply beginning a new paragraph when flying to a different theater. And I skip those parts, a few lines there. Burke's history, however, does something more than that. In a single sentence, the transit from North America uh, to Germany is made uh, thematically as a variation on the tune of English valor. And there's a quotation there. The war at sea further posed a formidable challenge to the historian of a global war due to the vast distance from one theater to another. Yet the writer of the history delivers on his promise to find connections between scattered incidents. And that's the second quotation in the slide. The deployment of tropes at key moments felicitously brings together the two terrains of the Ganges and the Ohio, the first the subject of a clause, the second the head of a prepositional phrase. Striding across this bridge built by figurative language, the dominant theme of the military honor of the English 
marches forward to bring together the two theaters of North America and India. Geography, however, does not just serve as a means of exhibiting the writer's uh, poetic skills. A salient feature of the history is the attention it pays to the locale. Where, where actions take place matters as much as who is performing the action. Not only the newspaper historians, but respectable historians of the age felt often tempted to give maximum attention to prominent individuals, for by so doing, they could turn history into a captivating story of strong-willed characters. David Hume makes the murder of Thomas Beckett appear more or less a self-afflicted tragedy caused by the ambition and ostentation in the martyred archbishop's character. While William Robertson's nuanced exposition of the Scottish Reformation detains the reader to offer an anatomy of the severe temper of the reformer John Knox, Burke also recognizes that the personality of the major players in the war, such as the rapid, vehement, impatient nature of Frederick II can affect the outcome of battles, but he abstains from applauding the epic valor of the Pr Prussian king. Individual characters may be important, but equally important is the regional context, which cultural and topographical uniqueness, whose cultural uniqueness manifests itself as a distinctive character or spirit in the sense of Montesquieu's spirit of the laws. And here are the examples here, which I'll just skip to save time. And uh, natural history, as well as cultural and political history, could also have significant bearing on the progress of the war efforts. The battle to conquer the French near the Niagara Falls in North America had tremendous significance for the British. And the second quotation here explains its, its significance here. And I'll just skip again those lines and move on to uh, the part where I, I talk about how, uh, with this summarizing sentence, Burke graphs the prehistory of the war on the topography of Niagara. His knowledge of the locale is never loosened from the context. And now moving on to the concluding part. In addition to the historical and topographical connections enriching his narrative, the writer of the history strove to maintain an impartial stance, which further contributes to his rhetoric of contextualization. And I skipped a few lines there. Uh, unlike contemporary histories of the war, Burke's history avoids lauding individuals. As we have already said, even the great man William Pitt never dominates the analysis of British war efforts. Only upon his sudden retirement from the government is he given a character sketch, which in itself is an excellent specimen of contextualization in that Pitt's extraordinary achievements are chained to the extraordinary circumstances of the war. That's the first quotation of the slide here. In my analysis, Pitt is praised, but also implicitly criticized for had it not been for the success of the war, is pushing the power of greatness of Britain to the most limits could never have seemed reasonable. Maintaining an equitable tone towards Britain's enemies would be another example of genuine impartiality. And skipping a few lines there. The history shuns all jingoistic gloating over the weaknesses of Britain's adversaries. Their predicaments are treated with sympathy and their emotives are anatomized without any moralistic sermonizing. France came to accept some genuinely pacific sentiments after the failure of the Bourbon alliance with Spain. While the more successful Britain lost its relish for military glory as victories were become familiar to us and made but little impression, such language leaves no place for a cheering encomium of Britain's military might. As a historian of the present war, Burke faithfully and successfully preserves a tone of impartiality in visiting different battle scenes and in examining the contending parties, both friend and foe. By doing so, he creates a sense of synthesis of embracing diverse agents and events as parts of constituting a broad context of interconnected action. Similarly, the bloodless war of political factions in Britain he analyzes without taking sides. Regarding the British support of Prussia, the history paraphrases the argument of the opposing parties, but refrains from judgment. Such prudence uh, is no simple expression uh, of modesty, but forms part and parcel of a principled belief in the duty of a historian held by the writer of history. When dealing with the heated dis disputes endemic to British politics, Burke would assert his unwillingness to pass any judgment and declare his conviction that his mission is to relay the opinions as well as facts historically. We are historians and not advocates, states Burke. Such self-conscious commitment to impartiality in discussing sensitive political issues confers a special value on Burke's history as it would disappear inevitably in the impassioned polemical ambience of Burke's later political discourse when he was an advocate rather than a historian, even though the historian in Burke would never disappear 
as Sora's excellent work uh, demonstrated. To the author of the history of the present world, however, the choice between being a historian and an advocate would have mattered less than that between a historian and a journalist. His declared profession of fidelity to his role as a historian in the serialized columns of annual periodical he was paid to write, collect, and compile betrays the tension he must have felt in undertaking his journalistic task. The editor of the annual register might have muttered to himself, I am a historian and not a journalist. He was indeed at the time a budding historian with a firm sense of his mission. In 1757, one year prior to his commitment to produce the annual register, he had signed a contract with the Dodsleys to write an essay towards an abridgment of the English history. Regarding Henry II's feud with Thomas Beckett in this unfinished work, Burke observes that historians should seek to contextualize the foundations and the nature of the remarkable period so as to avoid the injustice of judging the affairs of those times by ideas taken from the present manners and opinions. Burke's historical articles written for the annual register show the same effort to see things in their own terms and in their proper context as demonstrated by the rhetoric of contextualization we have thus far described. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm done for the time being. <laughs> Thank you so much for your uh, inspiring and nice presentation. And let me, uh, shall, I, shall we begin uh, our uh, discussion time? And so first discussant is, uh, sorry, first this. First discussant is, uh, Okay, okay. Now I can I can begin. So, uh, okay, okay, okay. You are uh, okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Chairman Shinji. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor mm -hmm. Yong. Thank you for your excellent article and the presentation. Frankly speaking, I'm not expert in this field on this topic but I would like to share my thoughts and trying to make some comments. Firstly, according to my understanding, in this article, Professor Yong mainly deal with the issue of contextualization in books historical writing for the annual register, because Edmund book was not satisfied to be only a journalist or news reporter. He want to be a genuine historian. So in order to achieve this goal, book had to find out, find out some rhetorical devices to contextualize all kinds of the occurrences mm -hmm. which have happened during the Seven Years' War. Mm -hmm. That is to say, to find out some connecting principle I noticed that in professors using the contextualization has the same meaning with connection. So by this means to transform the massive disconnected and chaotic information or events into systematic and well ordered, readable and meaningful historic reality. So in the second part, Professor Yun has enumerated and examined the different re rhetoric devices or connecting principle, such as uh, lessening the time frame, such as using geography, topography, and the natural history and the dominant theme as a con connecting principle. Mm. It's very interesting, interesting and instructive. But I also noticed that when Professor talking about this connecting principle mm -hmm. or rhetoric of the contextualization, mm -hmm. Professor said little or nothing about the causation, mm -hmm. causation mm -hmm. or the causal reasoning. Mm -hmm cause and effect relationship. But as we all know in the 18th century, 
philosophy, especially in David Hume's philosophy. Causation has been regarded as the most important connecting principle, which is always used to associate different and even seeming disparate ideas and events in our ordinary life and help us to understanding our surroundings and arranging our life. At the same time, causation as a connecting and organizing principle is also widely used in enlightenment history and enlightenment narrative. So in view of this, I'd like to know if causation or causal reasoning has any place in books, rhetoric con or contextualization or his mm -hmm. historic writing. Mm -hmm. If it does have some place, what role does it play in books, mm -hmm. rhetoric, or contextualization? Mm -hmm. So th this is my first point. Mm -hmm. Secondly, another important issue which Professor deal with is books claim to impartiality mm -hmm. and uh, nonpartisan stance, and the book's emphasis on the sensitivity to historical context and his stress on the sympathetic understanding of the historic agent and his effort to situate the event in a larger and wider historic process. Mm -hmm. So in this part, I found the striking similarities mm -hmm. or resemblances with David Hume mm -hmm. and other contemporary great philosophical historians Mm. such as Voiter, Montesquieu, mm. and uh, William Robson. Mm. So my second question is, is book a uh, philosophical historian? Mm. And uh, what's the relationship between the rhetoric or contextualization and the philosophical history? Mm. To what extent is book's rhetoric or contextualization mm. shared by the most uh, philosophical historian. Mm. So okay. th that's all my, 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 my question or comments. Mm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, time. Dr. Zhu. What if I take all the questions and then I can perhaps answer all the questions together? Uh, you, you can choose. You can well, rather prefer that because questions yeah, might overlap. Yeah, so yeah, three yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the first question is because you're talking about the different uh, sure. rhetoric devices. Yes. In, in your oh. usage, the, the, the uh, contextualization. Uh, defined... Sorry, I mean, well, what, what I said was uh, all three discussions, when I listen to all three quest discussions questions, like I'll go back to your question. And answer okay, them all okay, together. Okay, no okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, no, okay. No, 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 no. Okay, I, I, I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks very much, Dr. Zhu. Next discussant is uh, Dr. Sorosato. Sato san? I think I, I, I'm the last. I'm the last. I'm, I'm the last. I'm, 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 I'm not next. So. Next present uh, discussant is uh, uh, Dr. Zhang Zhenping. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Um, thank, thanks a lot for this uh, seminar and I learned a lot from uh, John's paper and uh, uh, in fact, I agree with Dr. Zhou because I, uh, both of us uh, translated David Hume's books, mm -hmm. <laughs> so not books, not and books, and uh, so I'm not very familiar with the books, uh, um, especially uh, earlier works 
Now, Edinburgh's earlier, I think, and the history, historical articles is very, uh, is uh, his um, earlier works. But uh, when uh, after I read this paper, and I have some questions uh, about because I taught uh, the history. Uh, of historiography of the Western world. So my first impression, my first mm -hmm. idea is, is I remembered in the um, the um, history of Polyponesia. Mm -hmm. oh. uh -huh. So uh, Polyponesia, mm -hmm. or yes. <laughs> uh, and then, no, the great great uh, Grecian history, uh, and um, if we talk about uh, Edinburgh's rhetoric, um, is uh, if we talk about Edinburgh's is an um, impartial history. So, uh, I, as for me, I will compare uh, these two history. But you know, uh, uh, Schuster's Schuster's is, um, um, I think, is a famous history. But uh, when Edinburgh, we 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 also uh, didn't name Burke as a history. So uh, we know uh, if a history uh, wants to write uh, a book of history, uh, he will pay attention to his re rhetoric. I know you pin uh, in our part two. You you give some very uh, very I think uh, give lots of uh, examples to for books. Uh, uh, for books uh, rhetoric uh, as uh, 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 the words and the term, but but how can uh, and my question is um, how can um, my question is um, uh, how can I how can the readers uh, when uh, when the readers uh, read books and the uh, uh, history of present war uh, that that like this and um, uh, did they read books uh, or understand books uh, opinions of the present war or just um, as an impartial or uh, narrative that's my question and um, um, the next uh, uh, I think the next question is about um, um, about when I about the uh, the, the, the political position. Edinburgh, we know Edinburgh is uh, uh, is or uh, is um, political. I I think a politician. Uh, I think uh, when when yes, we didn't take a take a. Burke's uh, early book in uh, as his uh, political uh, thought or, or political positions positions, but we know in 17th century in the British history, uh, I think like um, Robert Blighty or uh, Henry Spearman or William Pitt, uh, like this, I think a partition partition history. They wrote in their uh, British. Uh, it is not in the history of England or hist or British history, the non-history, the, the general history. They were they also has their um, political or Whigle, Whigle or Tory uh, uh, their attitude to uh, in during the I think during their uh, uh, their writings uh, uh, among their writings the history writings. So. Uh, when we say Edinburgh is um, impartial, I think in the conclusion, mm -hmm. it's an impartial uh, as, as an impartial history. Uh, so if we saw if we saw Edinburgh as an impartial history, uh, I think just uh, maybe we can limit the, this book in this annual. A rejection, uh, his uh, writing, or because book write another write others, uh, the uh, I think essays or other book works. So if this, if we we I, I don't know, I don't know. I I want consider if we will sort book as an impartial history. So 
to what the extent he is a, is an impartial history. I think uh, um, because um, when we talk about an uh, impartial history, we want we also want to know uh, to what position or book or uh, um, in other words, uh, Burke is uh, writing uh, the history of present or as an uh, English, as an Irish, or as an European. That's my question. Yes. <laughs> so, and uh, and the, the, the third question, of a very neat question, because I do some research on the natural history or conjectural history. And um, mm. In page, uh, page, page, you, you, you talk about uh, natural history. I think it's um, natural history is a, is a special uh, term or which mm, uh, page six, page six. Uh, uh, I, you, 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 you wrote in um, natural history as well as cultural and political history. Uh, I think natural history is, um, um, is um, I think, in my opinion, I think it's comes companion with or, or, or with cultural and political history because we know David Hume's natural history of religion and uh, it's totally different with the history of England. So that's a very <laughs> small, a small question. So uh, I, I don't know what to mean uh, natural history here. So okay. uh, it's only my confusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for your comment. And so the next present, uh, next discuss discussant is uh, doc uh, Dr. Sora Sato. Uh, please uh, begin the <clears throat> discussion. Yeah, so uh, let me share the screen. So this is my comment. And Tiffy, I have three questions. I think, you know, uh, it's sort of an excellent article. And article highlighted Bach's ideas and attitude towards uh, historians' impartiality and the attempt was very successful. The article also compared Bach's annual register with other contemporary literature on the Seven Years' War. And I think you know, it revealed Bach's intention and also achievement in his edition of annual register. <clears throat> so my first question is, could, could Bach be patriotic, a, yeah, can you see that, yeah. So can Bach be patriotic without losing impartiality? So in, in another word, a, can Bach, you know, be patriotic and at the same time, a impartial at the same time? It is often said, you know, there was no contradiction between patriotism and cosmopolitanism in 18th century Britain. The same person could be patriot and also cosmopolitan simultaneously. And I agree, Bach, before entering parliament, was very conscious of the importance of impartiality of historical writings. And he achieved it quite well. But at the same time, Bach wrote as a British, British writer, and he wrote to British readers. So sometimes he had to be patriotic. I mean, and, and he, he had to express his patriotic sentiment. So trying to be a patriot, a patriot, you know, often, but not always, create some kind of tension with impartiality. Mm. So one of the example may be the quotation uh, below uh, this one. Just, uh, this is comment, Buck's comment on 
Lord Granby, so John Manners, Marquess of Granby, who was commander of the British troops in the Seven Years' War. And Granby later became a very popular figure by his contribution to the, uh, to the war. And in this quotation, a Burke was conscious of British leaders and he spoke to, you know, he wrote to them. So again, you know, he is becoming kind of patriotic writer. And that I try to call. No commander has ever been more distinguished for an enterprising and generous courage and known half so much for an unlimited benevolence. By his whole conduct, he inspired foreigners with the favorable ideas of the English nobility. His character is indeed such as a we are apt in romantic ideas, fondly to conceive of our old English barons. It is with pleasure we attempt however, feebly to do justice to the merit of those men living or dead, who in this memorable war have contributed to raise this country to a pitch of glory and in which he has not been uh, exceeded by any other in ancient or modern times. Future history uh, will pay, pay them a reward more adequate to their merit. <clears throat> a, <clears throat> I think here, you know, he, he's writing as a British writer and he's, he's becoming more kind of patriotic and mm -hmm. expressing patriotic sentiment. And, and do you think still a, he's, he's not losing and impartiality? Do you think he's still impartial historian? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's possible. A, and basically I think a, the article is right. A, in the annual register, he was impartial historian, but sometimes, at the same time, he had to be, you know, patriotic writer. He he had to write as British writer. So, and that that creates some tension with kind of a uh, impartiality. And second question is uh, is like this. The second question is about his attitude towards France, which is important in thinking about his impartiality as a British historian. And the question is also about the connection between the early Bach and the later Bach. And especially I have in mind reflection on the revolution in France. And I quote, and I just just this time I I I I was neglecting you know this important passage, but I, I found this this time. <laughs> so the, just I quote the Parliament of France, which are Supreme Court of Justice and not the proper legislative authority, are since the state have been laid aside, become the depositories of the precious remains of liberty in that country. They have kept them uh, concealed in their tribunal, uh, whilst the principle of absolute power were in their vigor and too strong to be registered. But when the principle of monarchy first had declined a little from its strength, they began gradually to discover their right to the public and to assault them with a bigger that merit every praise and indeed beyond all example. I think it, this is a kind of liberal and also impartial attitude uh, toward France. Uh, France is still kind of absolute monarchy, but at the same time, uh, you know, Bach didn't get into stereotypical idea of France. Uh, Bach didn't regard France as a despotic nation. I mean, a probably partly despotic and absolute, but still, you know, that there, there was freedom in France. And I think this passage is quite similar to the uh, 
his depiction of Harudamon uh, in his reflection on the revolution mm -hmm. in France. Mm -hmm. And I think that passage in the reflection on the revolution in France is quite interesting because mm -hmm. a, for him, aristocrats of Harudamon are kind of intermediate power, intermediate mm -hmm. power between you know, king and people. A, and contributed to maintaining civil liberties in France. A, so that was the parlement was mm. his important in, institution for his his version of civilized monarchy. Mm. So yeah, of course, civilized monarchy is a Hume's idea, but I think we can find similar idea both in Anya Register and also in reflection on the revolution in France. So just what I want to say is a, oh, probably as article said, the impartiality disappeared after, you know, 17, 1764, after entering parliament. But do you think uh, still there is kind of connection, you know, about, you know, his political argument, connection between, you know, the early part and the later book. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comment? Mm -hmm. And my a uh, the final question is about similarities and also differences between Bach and contemporary famous historians. So I, I think we had two Hume experts. So I think mm -hmm. I'm I, I'm asking similar questions. But a uh, I think important contribution of the article, Professor Hay Hume's article is to reveal Bach's idea of historian's role. And in page eight, the article said, I quote, a when dealing with a heated dispute endemic to British politics, Bach would assert his unwillingness to pass any judgment and declare his conviction that his mission is to relate opinions as well as I, I thought this is excellent quotation and I, I, I've been, it's been long, you know, I, I, I'm reading annual register, but I, I didn't, it, it's a shame I didn't realize it. And at the same time, this quotation reminded myself of Adam Smith's mm -hmm. similar opinions in his Glasgow lecture, 1762. A, although Bach didn't know Smith's lecture, of course, mm -hmm. but he expressed similar ideas on historical writings just two years later. A, and here we have quotation. A, sorry, just I, I should mm -hmm. show the question first. Yeah, so just, just my question is a, <clears throat> is there any similarity and difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, between Bach and uh, some other famous historian of the age. And probably I should have quoted uh, from Adam Smith directly, but instead here we have quotation from a uh, Professor Richard Bach's uh, article on Coho. And in this article, uh, Professor Bach compared Coho with Adam Smith. And I think uh, this is interesting quotation. So let, let me, say. so I quote, in 1762, Adam Smith is reported to have observed, it is a task of history to record what affects the human species, an endeavor of this kind rapidly uh, distinguishes itself in the field of discourse from attempt at demonstration or persuasion. History seeks a uh, neither to prove nor convince an audience of a proposition. Its primary goal is to debate matters of fact connected to areas of human concern. More accurately still, it narrates fact or delay a uh, the character of the relationship among them. Narration, however, must first begin with description, since relations of fact presuppose that fact can be depicted 
Description, therefore, appears as a basic resource of a literary activity, but the art of description lies in the capacity to render particularly striking facts, striking in the sense of being either awesome or peculiarly uh, agreeable. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I'm finishing my comment. So, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so I, I think a, <clears throat> this is quite similar to yeah, yeah, Buck's idea in Onion Register. And just if you have any comments, a, please let, let me know. And a, the article a, mentioned William Robertson and also Dave Hume as well. So impartiality is a kind of common cry, I mean, kind of common opinion among mm. historians of the age. Mm. So Robertson was, William Robertson was Bach's favorite historian, mm. and Bach was critical of Hume, like many you know, contemporaries. But still, Bach learned a lot from Hume. Mm. And and when he was writing Annual Register, of course, he was, a, he was already a leader of Hume's history, English history. Mm -hmm. And all of them, Bach, Hume, Robertson, expressed the importance of impartiality and tried to achieve it. Mm -hmm. In Bach's opinions, Robert, Robertson, William Robertson did quite well, but Hume could not. Probably, you know, a historian today, you know, may disagree with Bach's assessment. We, we, we think, you know, Hume was in partial history and, and Bach was not. Probably. But, a, yeah, I think that article a, also compared annual register with other contemporary account of the Seven Years War. I think that was excellent co comparison and I, I have learned a lot. And the article concluded Bach was more impartial than other historians on Seven Years' War. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was convincing. I think that was right. And but what, what about Robert Bach compared to Robertson or Hume or mm -hmm. to Summers? A, can you find any difference? Okay. Yeah, that's my comment. Thank you. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for all, all of you. And uh, I, I think I can now share my, the, the, remain, the, the remaining slides because this is exactly what I thought would pop up in, in your questions. Now, uh, before I do so, perhaps I may go to uh, I slide once again and answer uh, Dr. Zhang's third question, which is the simplest. What, what do I mean by natural history? I mean natural history in the sense of the contemporary idea, because uh, in, in the later volumes of Annual Register, there will be a section on natural history. That would be the section title. And there you have all kinds of things put, put together. It's, it's miscellaneous. It's not natural history in the sense of Darwinian evolutionary sense. You have geography, you have ethnography, you have just, just about everything. So, uh, and, and it also relates to the question about uh, what we mean by history. Uh, Dr. Zhang mentioned Tukididis and so on. Now, we, we, should, we should remember that history as founded by the father of history, Herodotus, was similarly a rather mixed miscellaneous genre where and Herodotus' histories uh, could be described as much as an area studies of Persian empire as history proper of the war between the Greek states and Persia. So uh, geography and the cultural analysis of the backgrounds, all of that is extremely important, was perhaps more important for Herodotus than, than the actual cause and effect. And this goes to uh, Dr. Zeus questions about causality. Now, as we all know, uh, Spurk was, an, was a, a sworn enemy of metaphysics of all kinds. So the metaphysical sense of notion of uh, need causation is something which he would shun and criticize and battle all his life. And we can really see that already in his early work, such as Annual Register, the, the articles of the Annual Register, because uh, 
the, in, in offering this context of uh, its historical background and its geographical background and so on, he is also giving us a, a kind of co a structure of cause and effect. I mean, certain the Seven Years' War can never be understood unless we, are, we know something about the 30, year, 30 Years' War. So that would be a, the, the remote, but perhaps quite a, a very significant, important cause of what was happening, at least in the German theatre. In, in, the, in the phrase, and, and and then he has many other things to say about how certain incidents would lead to one to the another, the the dispute between the Nouvelle France and the thirteen colonies over the Ohio Valley, and so on. So we have quite a lot of causation. I mean, uh, I should uh, preface first of all by telling you that I was uh, I had I was the, the word limit imposed on me in this collection of articles was extremely strict, so I had to cut off many many different things. And I really have loved to talk about uh, things in a much greater depth. And besides, my fellow contributors were mostly uh, interested in the linguistic or historical side. So, and so uh, I would I, I I can answer that uh, there is causation, but except that this is historical causation, which has to be inherently different, if not hostile, to the metaphysical causation. And of course, Hume the historian should be quite different from Hume the metaphysician. In that, in that regard. And perhaps, as we all know, Hume the historian was much more popular in his own time than Hume the philosopher, who is perhaps exclusively cultivated uh, by the moderns. And many other questions relate to the question, issue of impartiality. Dr. Dr. Zhu, Dr. Zhang, and uh, Dr. Dr. Sato, is impartiality truly possible? I would answer, first of all, that uh, my focus is on the rhetoric. So I could, I, I also have said it's a, uh, there's a rhetoric of impartiality because uh, a strict impartiality is perhaps in itself quite impossible. I mean, how can you be uh, an impartial judge on matters which concern all kinds of political interests of various kinds? And we are talking about a war, a war between Britain and its enemies. And uh, you have to be patriotic to a certain extent. If you're not, then uh, uh, your article would not be accepted by the reading public. And this uh, goes to the earlier premise of my, my approach, because here we are looking at Burke, not just as Burke the person, that's the person also showing, presenting his views. He is a hired journalist at the same time. So he has to write things and say things which the reading public would accept. So he can't really baffle them or challenge them or annoy them too much. So he can't really uh, say horrible things about, <laughs> about the British and he can't really bring out his Irish sentiments about all these things and so on. So he certainly had to keep his real, true, personal intents uh, quite uh, subdued. And, uh, and also, um, but perhaps in, even in later Burke, I mean, I'm sure uh, Richard Burke and all the other great scholars would always remind us, and F.P. Locke, for instance, that for Burke, his style, his rhetoric cannot always be separated from his intentions and ideas. So rhetoric uh, for Burke at least has a much more of a positive and substantial role to play than we normally associate, uh, normally grant uh, in, in speaking of rhetoric and so on. So uh, impartiality is rhetorical, but rhetorical in the Burkean sense is to admit much greater personal kind of, uh, intention than we normally would grant. And is he, what, what would be his identity, asked Dr. Zhang, is he writing as, a, as an Englishman, as an Irishman, as a European. Well, he will always refer to himself as an Englishman, even in his political speeches later on. And, but he's also, as we know, was a, a committed cosmopolitan European, and, also, uh, and not just European, because I mean, I always consider his uh, uh, speeches in the impeachment trial of Warren Hastings to be one of his greatest achievements as an individual, as a politician, as a philosopher in action. And here he is being the advocate of the in Indian people people in Bengal, and that surely is something which uh, the so-called post-colonials ought to have uh, applauded, which they haven't at all so far, as far as I see it. So uh, is it possible to be patriotic without being impartial? I guess I, I answered. And I mean, uh, and thank you very much, Sora, for that excellent quotation where he praises Granville. And we, we can sense in, in the quotation that uh, he is really, putting in genuine uh, personal sentiments about Granby because he liked the person. But, but when you compare that with what he has to say about uh, uh, William Pitt, uh, which, which now we can have a closer look, we can see that he, and that is, well, is clearly one continuity between the early Burke, later Burke, as you, as you know, he was always, always been enemy of Chatham 
and so on. So where he's saying, all right, you, you guys, everyone is praising Pip and so on. But for me, Pip is perhaps the creature of the circumstances. It's really the war which made him great. And, it's, and had, had the war been less successful, then he would really have uh, uh, been charged with all kinds of excess and so on. It's, so he was a great guy, no doubt, but uh, nothing but success could have uh, made it feel reasonable, which, which is quite uh, saying quite a lot <laughs> about the character and the, perhaps the, the rash uh, nature of uh, Pitts or, or kind of uh, even despotic kind of aspect of his war policies and so on. And uh, about finally, uh, Hume. <laughs> well, I know that it's an extremely dangerous thing to say anything slightly negative about Hume, because Hume is perhaps the most sacred name in our own time uh, for many different reasons. I won't really want to go into that. Uh, so it's not really me saying, having anything to do with anything to say critical about Hume. It's, uh, it's Burke himself. And here he, here he is. Uh, this is the book review section of the annual register. And he's reviewing Hume's history of England, and he has a very curious thing to say about it. He first praises him, now we, now we finally have a great historian in Britain. Only the French were very good now, we do have it. And he says, no man perhaps has come nearer to that so requisite and so rare a quality in history of unprejudiced partiality. A very, very delicate, sophisticated and nuanced way. So what is this? Is it, so is he saying Hume was, is impartial or he is partial, unprejudiced, unprejudiced partiality. So one part is partial, but he's also without prejudice. But he is prejudiced, as we all know, uh, particularly in this part where he talks about him, uh, Thomas Becker because he's prejudiced against Christianity and he finds uh, Thomas Becker to be a bigot who is rash and he is wreaking havoc on the rule of law. And whereas Henry II emerges as extremely rational and politician statesman. And that's being extracted from this point onward. And, uh, and also in his uh, fragment on the history of England, he has, and that, that the part which I quoted clearly can be linked to this review of Hume or the, or the preamble to the extracts to, to Hume there. So on prejudice partiality of Hume, uh, he is mostly, a, a, mostly impartial, but he can be rather partial in an unprejudiced way when it comes to religion, when it comes to Christianity and so on. Now, Re Robertson's uh, uh, sort of reminded us will, will always be uh, the model for Burke and I'm sure they have uh, very much in common, except perhaps that uh, uh, Burke uh, wasn't a historian <laughs> and it answers some of the questions uh, put by my Chinese colleagues. Uh, While well, his career steered towards politics and as a politician, you could never be a wholehearted historian because you, well, be, you belong to a certain party. And he also has a philosophy of party in, uh, in, in his writing and so on. So it'll be very interesting perhaps, or it could be my uh, future project to trace how Burke, the early Burke uh, somehow makes his way into his later book or how it disappears altogether in his later book. And, uh, and here we have, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, Burke's, Burke's speeches and the impeachment of Warren Hastings and where he uses history in his own way. But it's history with a, with a bone to pick, with a clear agenda. So he's aiming at his target, Warren Hastings, and government in India, et cetera, so, so forth, and in the reflections on the revolutions in France. I mean, their historical analysis, but history always has a point to make. It's moving towards a certain target. And so on. So uh, that sense of orientation is something which perhaps uh, uh, would be quite lacking in uh, in his, in, which we don't quite find uh, to be present in the earlier book. In my own favorite book is perhaps uh, his very last book, Letter to a Noble Lord. He's extremely angry, bitter, his son is dead, and the government finally, uh, the crowd gives him a pension, and they grudge the pension. He says, Who are you? to do so. You come from the usurpers, you Lord Russell. And uh, I just love this part. Mine was from a mild benevolent sovereign. His, your ancestor from Henry VIII. And Henry VIII almost becomes like, like, like a swearing words. I mean, like an abuse. Mine had not its fund in the murder of any innocent person of illustrious rank or in the pillage of any body of unoffending men. And he's also passing judgment on the English Reformation. Uh, 
in a, with a very strong voice, no doubt. His grants were from uh, aggregates and consolidated funds of judgments iniquitously legal and from possessions voluntarily surrendered by the lawful proprietors with the gibbet at their door. So they were there was a legality, but there was also sheer violence uh, behind it. So that's really perhaps the hallmark work we are familiar with. And whereas if we uh, go back to the quotations which I shared with you, I mean, uh, this is uh, much more of a tranquil Pacific Burke and surely impartial Burke compared with this very angry and politically charged Burke whom he would become and which perhaps, I mean, he enjoyed in his own way and so on. So, uh, and, and thank you also, uh, Dr. Slat, about the, uh, your quotation about the Parlement of uh, France and so on. And I, and I do think, I, I entirely agree with you. I mean, as far as France is concerned, we see him that he was already passionately interested in France and also in, in East Indies, by the way. So uh, uh, he was perhaps doing all this preparatory research, which would now, uh, which would make him a very strong authority on these issues of East India Company and, and France. So, uh, so he was no kind of, uh, uh, no charlatan, no, no, no opportunist as far as these issues were concerned. So he, he was making his money for his new family, but he was also was doing a lot of studying in his own way. So we can see that how he, he looks into the society and history of, of France and he, he, he spots its uniqueness, its special qualities. All of that uh, would also uh, be, I, I ought to have perhaps, if I was given enough more word, word space by my editor, I would have loved to include that part because I mean I that I also had a look at that part where he talks about the, the element of liberty going into the Parlement de France and so on, which was a superb analysis. So, so I had to cut off many of these things. <laughs> and uh, I thank you all three of you for allowing me to bring up bring some of these things up once again. If I haven't answered all your questions, uh, do for, forgive me <laughs> or since. I think there would be others who are waiting to share their thoughts and ideas. Okay. Oh, hello, Paul. Hello, Hadrian. <laughs> yes. Any, any Actually, comments? Oh, yes. Could, could I ask? Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps I, I could ask a brief. Um, well, one thing will be very uh, simple, really, about the the publishing and the the mm -hmm. um, popularity and distribution. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wondered what was the sort of model of, of publishing. Was it kind of like an original subscription basis or, you know, like what would, because presumably as an octavo, it must have been pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. But you said, I mean, so it's successful, presumably because there was mm -hmm. a high rate of profit. Mm -hmm. But but I'm just wondering about the extent of, of readership or perhaps what, I mean, you, you mentioned obviously the ripoffs, you know, the mm -hmm. the sort of Dublin uh, uh, mm -hmm. plagiarism and, and, and so on. But presumably that there might have been other ways in which they, you know, excerpted or, or had other kind of, um, you know, publications of the annual register took parts out or whatever. Mm -hmm. and so that's the sort of simple question about the sort of the publishing okay. and the okay. readership and distribution. Mm -hmm. And then the other one on the kind of intellectual, I guess, building on Sora's mm -hmm. point about about uh, patriotism and partiality mm -hmm. and impartiality. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, I, I wonder how you would um, situate or relate or if Burke mm -hmm. at any point um, discusses uh, Bolingbroke you know, as an English mm -hmm. historian, mm -hmm. I'd have thought he'd be one of the most, and, and of course, also as a politician mm -hmm. slash political, mm -hmm. you know, philosopher. And of course, he has that mm -hmm. famous line about history being in you know, a philosophy teaching by example or something. Mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking about in the sense of, you know, some of the excerpts and the coverage of the continental war, a figure like, like Frederick the Great of, mm -hmm. of Prussia. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder how much there's, there's, um, you know, discussion of, of, uh, sort of monarchy and what you might mm. relate to things like Bolingbroke, you know, the Patriot King, because you would, mm. you would expect at this kind of time, you know, mm. 1750s, 60s, mm. through the early 1770s, you would associate, you know, Burke okay. with, with a sort of Whig scepticism about an excessively mm. powerful crown. 
mm. you know, obviously culminating in that 1770, you know, this idea mm -hmm. of the, the double, the secret cabinet and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of subverting mm -hmm. the constitution and so on. So I'm kind of interested in, in basically Burke's mm. earlier historical ideas of kingship and monarchy mm -hmm. and maybe a sort of I comparing see. and contrasting with a figure like Bolingbroke. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Paul, for your few questions. Mm -hmm. About the publishing uh, format, I mean, I, 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 as far as I, as I am aware of, I mean, it wasn't really based on any subscription, so we just was, went straight to the market. And, uh, and this person, the publisher, Dotsley, he really knew the market, and he had this kind of a savvy sense of what would sell and what wouldn't. And of course, also uh, in these uh, in this period, uh, your access to uh, privileges of these postal services would also be very important which we also had had access to so he was quite a, a very very important and powerful figure Dosby was so uh, I, I don't think he had any problem uh, advertising his works in the, in the booksellers so. and uh, for, for the actual uh, composition of the annual register actually is perhaps uh, although I haven't really done the actual calculating we, we might say uh, more about 70% or even more was really is entirely recycled material from other works. And that was what they were doing all the time, starting from the gentleman's magazine and so on. Well, that is in itself really a call for a great deal of labor, <laughs> sifting and selecting and copying and so forth. And Berg was, had his own assistants still. I mean, it was really entirely up to him to compile, for instance, the chronology of the events and the characters and so on. So in any case, it was a huge, almost Herculean work which he was undertaking. And in doing so, as I uh, made a point earlier on, he certainly was, teach was informing himself about many of the diverse features of society, of the of European societies and countries. And uh, so there was clearly an educational side to his journalistic labor here. But as for the publication itself, I would say, it, it, I mean, it was uh, conducted by one of the most ablest publisher, bookseller, bookseller, as they were, as they were called. And uh, so he didn't really, he need not have worried about the actual kind of success, commercial success of India. Uh, according to some calculations, I mean, uh, some of the earlier volumes would reach uh, even eight or nine editions in a matter of two or three years, at least those covering the earlier phase of the war, because there simply wasn't anything as comprehensive, as authoritative as the works account of the wars coming in from uh, the earlier phase and so on. So I, I, even in, on, on that score alone, I would, I would should say his uh, articles for the annual register during the Seven Years' War does merit to be included in this collection of uh, his, his writing the speeches, which it wasn't, which I think is something of an oddity, well, because there is always the sense that if you were uh, writing anonymously for someone else in a journalistic uh, context, then you weren't really a thinker, philosopher at all. And uh, I certainly would want to uh, um, differ as far as that part is concerned, because I, I really have much more of a uh, booty an idea of the authorship, if uh, you're familiar with B.A. Bouthier. Uh, for him, uh, if, when you have an author, there are authors who create the authors. They are creators of creators, and the, the context, the field, the literary production is something which a historian, a publication, a historian of literature uh, ought to be looking at. And in, in that regard, I mean, my placing Burke with Stotsley was fairly intentional because you won't be having, you, you, we would probably would not have had Burke had it not been for Dossley. He supported his uh, early publications and Dossley would always be the publisher, uh, the, 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 the younger Dossley, the Ro Robert Dossley when James died. Uh, uh, James Dossley, by the way, Robert died. He would also be the publisher virtually of all the old Burke's works. So uh, uh, Burke's relationship with the house, publishing house of Dossley in itself, I, I suppose is a worthy topic of research, which Perhaps just doesn't really sound as fanciful, as sexy as uh, comparing Burke with Hume or Robertson and so on. So all of these things really did have a great deal of uh, footwork. You know, you have to get down to your materials, to the ledgers and all these things. So, okay, about your questions about Burke's idea of kingship. I, from my, from my, what I gathered from my reading of these his historical articles was that he, he doesn't really offer any kind of coherent philosophy as far as these political systems is concerned, because uh, 
uh, Frederick II is really a kind of a loony, is, is a mad case in his own way, but uh, he doesn't make any judgment as to his uh, political kind of wisdom. And uh, that is something which could, which may come as something of a surprise, knowing as we do how he would have a very consistent, like, vehement and outspoken stance on these issues as soon as he enters the parliament. So <laughs> what was he doing all the time? Uh, it's very hard, hard to uh, have conjecture that part. And I think that's something which we always have to bear in mind when looking at his articles in these annual register because uh, uh, he was writing as himself as Edmund Burke, but Edmund Burke, uh, as yet wasn't the Edmund Burke, which he would later become. So uh, he may not really have felt uh, uh, qualified or obliged to uh, speak out on these very important issues, which many people like Wallingbrook and others and you and so on were talking about. And, I, and this also goes back to the, some of the earlier questions about my colleagues uh, between Whig, Whig and Tories and this past factional divide. Could one be really uh, impartial in this in this circumstances? Uh, and as uh, we all know, I mean, there was a great deal of uh, criticism of the war policies of Britain as far as this German uh, support was concerned, because the money was going into Germany. And when, they, when the uh, London merchants and everyone else uh, thought we, it makes uh, perfect sense to fight for our colonies in North America, because there, it means money. <laughs> why, why, why pay Frederick II and why send our poor boys to fight for him because uh, money wasn't really the issue at all. I mean, it was the, the issue of the Hanover, <laughs> uh, the royal family and so on. So uh, the German war efforts was never really as popular as the uh, North American kind of war. So, and that's, that could have been a very good uh, object, topic for to, to show, to display to share his political thoughts of various kind. And that's where Burke, in the, at least in this early book, is, become, is uh, being extremely cautious. <laughs> so it's not really taking sides at all. And that's why I would readily call him uh, an impartial historian or an impartial journalist even, which again, would be something more similar to we have an impartial journalism <laughs> in our time, or did we have one in the 18th century at all? It's becoming increasingly difficult to be an impartial professor, <laughs> even, isn't it? As we all know, at least on some certain sensitive issues of race, gender, etc. Oh, I should stop here. Well, thanks very much, Paul. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you for your discussion. And, and, and uh, is there another question? Is there any other question? Yes, I had my hand raised. If yes, you know. yes, please, please, please. Okay, um, well, thank you so much, um, Professor. Hello, hi, that, can be, hello. hi, hi. Uh, <laughs> that was, thanks for presenting. I, mm -hmm. I really, I read the paper in the, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot. Um, and I was actually, you know, because I, I also come from a literature background um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I'm a little familiar with uh, English literature as well, like Samuel Richardson, mm -hmm. Lawrence Stern, mm -hmm. and, um, especially with some of the um, analyses you did of, of these passages, I was just thinking um, to what extent was Burke also kind of playing with, kind of trying to, you know, take um, a, a, um, a, um, maybe in dialogue with uh, the novel at this point, which was mm -hmm. you know, kind of, uh, still developing as a genre. Mm -hmm. And some of what you were, um, I, I also thought like you mentioned the kind of the temporality of his periodical, it's different from the, the like the much more frequent uh, mm -hmm. kind of newspapers, journals, but then um, it's actually like, uh, I think um, uh, Stern's novel was, for example, it was published over the course of seven years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I was wondering, like, is the temporality mm -hmm. of this register kind of more similar mm -hmm. to that of novels mm -hmm. at this point? Um, and then also there, I, I, I recall um, a, a lot of novels that kind of present themselves as histories at this point as well, mm -hmm. because kind of like being a fantasy or a novel was, you know, like you wanted to distance yourself from potentially telling fantastical or untrue events just for the sheer sake of entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I was just thinking about that, about like this distinct, okay. the distinction between fiction, novel and history, you know, it wasn't this, this actually like your, your analysis shows that perhaps mm -hmm. that's, that, that's, and also the epic. Um, I think mm -hmm. one of the 
um, the passages you had kind of reminded me of the Iliad, where he, mm -hmm. sure, uh, sure. yeah, like like the king of Prussia in person, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. modest fire, that one. So, yeah. So, um, and and then the word scene and theater came up a lot as well. So I, mm -hmm. I was also thinking about tragedy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Anyway, so thanks, thanks a lot for this uh, really great uh, paper. Well, thank you for your wonderful comments uh, about the novel, which actually uh, ought to be my, my staple <laughs> area and so on. And uh, uh, to, uh, to conjecture to, to perhaps guess what uh, Burke thought about this new genre, which yet, yet did not really have its name, as you point out. I mean, uh, the, the works reviewed in the annual register included, uh, as far as I know, uh, just Two, at least in that period, uh, included two famous canonical works. One, one would be Restless by Samuel Johnson, which is an extremely boring work, which not, not my students, not, not many of my students will, will want to read. And the other would be uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Emile, and, and which again is a novel, but it is much more, much less than a novel in this world. And so uh, the, and Tristram Shandy, although published by the same publisher, Dossley, uh, did not make it into the list of the books reviewed by the annual register. So uh, you can see a uh, book uh, browsing through all the publications of the year and say, all right, this, I like this one, this is important. History, uh, books of history will always be, have a greater preference over other things in the books re reviewed by the annual register. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the novel at that time was extremely unstable and the kind of uh, serious approach to uh, the facts and these critical moments of history and its changes, historical causality, all of that, would have to wait for, for uh, Walter Scott and the, in the uh, early 19th century. So there was, there was no real historical novel proper in the 18th century at all. So I would say that uh, why not perhaps read this, uh, the history of the present war as a historical novel, because it's, it's historical novels. By no means would be lies. I mean, they would be have to be based on the actual facts and so on. And it's all a matter of uh, presenting the thing in a certain way that they may appeal to the readers and so forth. So, from uh, my sort of administrative or official position, I mean, as a, someone who uh, is being paid uh, in the Department of English Literature, Language and Literature, so on, I would want to plead that uh, my my interest uh, would be entirely justified by 18th century standards, when literature would always be in something which is quite broad and so on, where there would be no strict uh, sense of dichotomy between fact and fiction at all, and where the word history, as you point out, would be an elusive term, I mean, juggled here and there, and so uh, Henry Fielding calling his work history and so on, and Richardson similarly calling his the Clarissa the history of a young lady so on. So history were always, even in the, in the lectures by Adam Smith, which someone earlier mentioned, uh, Smith uh, talks about history really as a rhetorical genre. I mean, Tacitus, Tacitus, and so on. So this is how you tell the story, how you narrate things. So we're not, not in the sense that history is a different kind of order of discourse in, in the manner of uh, Michel Foucault's ideas, uh, which inherently has different kind of principles and parameters and priorities from the novel and so on. All of that is, I think, somewhat anachronistic. I mean, it, it may apply to the uh, later century, 19th century and beyond, but 18th century at least has the virtue of uh, being much more liberal as far as these uh, charming divisions are concerned. So they could just go back and forth in various ways. So. Uh, uh, I, I may perhaps encourage some of my future students, if I have one, <laughs> to look into this possibility of continuity between uh, the historical writings which emerged in the 18th century by the great thinkers such as Hume, Robertson, Burke, and so on, and how they somehow make, uh, make their way into uh, Walter Scott's historical novels, and how Walter Scott in, in turn would be influencing Balzac in France and Dickens and Fenimore Cooper in America. So that'll be a quite uh, interesting way of looking at the kind of uh, the family picture of uh, literature and history somehow belonging to the same kind of uh, same order, same world, which is, which is more or less my conviction as far as <laughs> my position is concerned. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, another, other questions? 
Oh, uh, Professor okay. Yun, uh, can I can I go for the question? No, please, please. please. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm a doctor student from Yonsei University, Hwang Uh, so well, those concepts are pretty new that you introduce and explain. Well, my understanding of uh con context and contextualization and partiality in Burke's uh writing, uh, is this something like can can we understand in that way? Is it is kind of a reflection of human instinct uh, that, I mean, like when we read a narrative and when we read a story, mm -hmm. then the first question we might have to the story is it, oh, is that a true story? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you want to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And when somebody writes only the factual mm -hmm. things on the paper, then we will get easily bored Mm -hmm. So contextualization and mm -hmm. impartiality in in the narrative is mm -hmm. it like a reflection of human in instinct, like something um, that in uh, place in between this, like uh, the desire for factual mm -hmm. things in the narrative, mm -hmm. and also the desire to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And also, I thought that I mean, for example, if we connect that contextuality or impartiality concept mm -hmm. to the early form of novel, uh, mm -hmm. such as uh, Robinson Crusoe, then we read that that kind of uh, desire mm -hmm. that people want to be entertained, but at the same time, want mm -hmm. all those details and mm -hmm. to, to sound mm -hmm. like factual okay. things, sound like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So can we kind of- sure. I mean, I'm asking like whether my understanding is right or not. <laughs> well, I think it's a, it's a wonderful question. Thank you very much because uh, well, we haven't, I mean, we are obviously unable to look at how the readers accept the, uh, the histories of the present war in the annual register and why it was popular to go back to a Paul's question earlier on, because it must have really appealed to a certain part of the reader's instinct, as you put it. So uh, now you are, perhaps uh, treading this territory of the natural history of the reading of these journalistic articles. Uh, now, if we actually have a look at the, the annual issues of the annual register or any other monthly or weekly periodicals of the time, we find that the British reading public at the time, uh, they, for them, the entertainment and in, in from being informed uh, these two weren't really that different at all. So you, they liked facts very much. I mean, and they're learning about the facts, they're being informed about what's happening here and there, was really the entertainment. And that's something which uh, we should perhaps uh, bear in mind when speaking of the enlightenment, because enlightenment isn't really about this club of great thinkers, I mean, getting together and bashing all the fools uh, outside them. It was really this new culture of people being very much keen to learn, to, 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 to know about these facts and facts become matters of fact. That's the kind of phrase which, you, which will pop up in all kinds of contexts here and there. It becomes an extremely venerable and important and valuable and attractive word, phrase, matters of fact. So if we were to do a kind of uh, big data uh, word research, I'm sure we will get a lot of uh, these instances of matters of fact popping up in all kinds of different contexts here and there. So matters of fact, very important, Robinson Crusoe, as you put it, very important in these, uh, the annual register, very important in many other things here and there and so on. So uh, these were fact loving people. They were being entertained by facts facts, both historical and political, and also uh, uh, natural, because in the, in the natural history sections, they will be learning about how you make certain things and how plants are grown and so forth. So there's a great deal of uh, practical interest which these people really were sharing, which they were uh, propagating and, dis and disseminating. And uh, that surely should account for uh, the, the, the success of the Industrial Revolution in, in 18th century Britain, because there, there was a culture and not just the technology. People were always focusing on the great technological inventions of work and so on. But before that, there was that really that mindset, that psychology, if you will, of people who, uh, who were venerating, who were respecting, and who were uh, searching after all kinds of facts, I mean, of various kinds. So, yes, contextualization. <laughs> 
uh, in a sense, uh, would be le less entertaining than uh, the, the facts themselves to answer your question. Because, so they would, uh, these people, the readers would want to know about what happened in this battlefield and why they lost or why they won and so on. Uh, Burke would digress almost and say, all right, wait a minute, you have to know something about the history of that, or you have to know about the geography. So uh, that would be, or if it's an entertainment, it was a different kind of entertainment, much more of a reflective intellectual pleasure than the kind of uh, pleasure of uh, learning things, of, of grasping or being informed. So uh, I guess there are two different registers, or more journalistic entertainment of getting the facts instantly, and also more philosophical entertainment of uh, thinking about knowing about this causality, to go back to uh, uh, Dr. Zhu's earlier question. The historical credit, of course, and so on. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, is there other question? Okay, and uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Latunapala, please uh, begin your. Please. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Yoon. Hello, Michael. Um, Hi. Thank you. Hello, and I thank you for your wonderful mm -hmm. talk. And you know, it's so much to take in. I was, um, I just, I, I suppose I have um, two two questions that just kind of thoughts that came out of the, the your talk and also the discussions. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, you know, what, see what you think about this. Um, you know, I'm kind of more, as you know, I work more in the 19th and 20th century, so I was kind of referring back to kind of Burke's influence, if you like, and uh, and um, themes that come out of his great legacy. Um, that, that question, first of all, about or oh, that kind of interesting point about patriotism vis-a-vis -vis impartiality hmm. uh, I thought that I had was I wonder if we could link that also to Burke I think it, I mean I, I I will definitely misquote Burke here but it was his speech to his constituents when he first entered parliament um, and um, he, uh, he said something like he apologized to them that he no longer would be representing them as constituents but rather the whole nation mm -hmm. and I wonder whether we can think of his in this as kind of him saying he's going to be impartial for the sake of a greater patriotism. Mm -hmm. That is to say, patriotism isn't the, isn't the minor thing, it's the bigger thing. And impartiality is the thing you'll have to be mm -hmm. in, order to, in order to accommodate that greater patriotism mm -hmm. for the nation. Anyway, something just, um, uh, just uh, maybe another way to think about it. Um, what your thoughts on that would be interesting. The other point I uh, came to my mind was about the, the impact of Burke's contextualization on current mm -hmm. events, the fascinating idea and you know, mm. or current wars that he's contextualizing. Mm. And I thought, yeah, we can think about writers and philosophers, but also perhaps active politicians contextualizing mm. events in speeches. Mm. The example that came to mind was Churchill, mm. because you know, the, the, recently, as uh, mm. people know, I was, I was kind of reading kind of Churchill's speeches in the Second World, mm. during the Second World War. He's in his speeches narrating the course of the Second World War mm. to the nation. He's telling them this is these are the uh, this is what's going on. Actually, he's been he's been narrating also the prelude to the war in the 30s through appeasement and you know, the problems with that. But I just wonder whether there's a beyond the rhetor the rhetorical kind of you know legacies of Burke and Churchill and so mm -hmm. on. Whether there is maybe a um, you know it's interesting you said kind of the, as you say you kind of this kind of uh, uh, misnomer kind of poli pol politicians doing philosophy, but here. Mm -hmm politicians kind of narrating and contextualizing mm -hmm. current mm -hmm. events. Is there, maybe is there, could there be a Burkean legacy in politics mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. that way? Anyway, just two, two thoughts. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for your wonderful comments. But about, uh, first to comment on your second point, I hope that becomes a legacy in the future as well, because there certainly is a tradition of these politicians studying history and so on, at least in the undergraduate years. And uh, Churchill, of course, was a great historian in his own way and won his Nobel Prize for his work in the history of mankind. So uh, yes, yes, I think you're right. I mean, in the, at least in the English parliamentary debates, at least until Churchill, if not in our own time, you really had to contextualize historically anything which you wanted to present to convince and so on. So I think that could perhaps, uh, if we cannot really uh, attribute it entirely to Burke, I mean, uh, Burke did play a very important role in making it something a very useful, very venerable, very I mean, effective, and something of a standard uh, for later politicians to emulate in their own way. So uh, being a historian and a politician surely uh, would not be, be incompatible compared with being a philosopher <laughs> and a politician. And so, or is it? I'm not really sure. Uh, it, it depends on how we define, how we understand the word of philosophy. 
I mean, the philosophy understood in the 18th century sense, or philosopher understood in the 18th century sense, which was simply mean intellectuals. So they were all philosophers of various kinds, and not just those who were studying uh, Wittgenstein <laughs> or, or Hegel or Heidegger. No one actually studied Wittgenstein in the 18th century, of course. So uh, Hume and Burke, or all these people are philosophers by, by that uh, kind of standard. Uh, your first question about, uh, uh, what, what, what was your first question? Sorry. Pat Patrick. Oh, Patrick, and... right. Okay. Right. I mean, I, uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, we see Burke even in this earlier phase as a cosmopolitan. I mean, he is looking at, he's surveying this war which is taking place all around the world, in, the, in India, or even in the Philippines, and so on. And he's doing his best, in my view, as someone who would be presiding over these things without really. Uh, jumping into and supporting this or that cause and so on. So that's a kind of uh, a universality which uh, he, he, I would say, which he pursued all throughout all his career with, with different degrees of uh, commitment. So uh, Bristol uh, would be much less important than Britain as a whole. But then again, if we, if we consider the case of Warren, the impeachment of Warren Hastings, humanity would be much more important than interest and the national interest links to the British East India Company. And so on. So, and uh, therefore, I mean, uh, the impeachment was bound to fail because <laughs> it went against the grain of the national interest, which was very much uh, yoked links to uh, many, many things which were have taken place in Bengal. And so, on. and his his studying uh, Indian history and reading reading the Quran, all of that surely makes him quite an exceptional figure in my view, even in the in this world of uh, impartial philosophers, which the century abounded with. So uh, patriotism would come in at some point as a as a expression of his universalism, but I, I, and of course the word patriotism also had a very specific sense in the Irish context. If you were a patriot in Ireland, you were supporting certain kind of things and so on in the American sense of being a patriot and so forth. So uh, his attachment to uh, his own country, well, I mean, it goes back to uh, Dr. Zhang's question, which country is his country, <laughs> Ireland or England, Britain? Uh, certainly, I mean, England, he was an English politician, but still, I think he always uh, was uh, someone who felt he belonged to the entire world, entire humanity under God. And that's something which I don't think uh, we moderns, we postmoderns are really prepared to uh, appreciate or even to accept as feasible as possible. You are either supporting this or that position, this, this or that political position. And if you're supporting the humanity, uh, if you're a humanitarian, you're actually doing something very extremely politically uh, specified, aren't you? You are humanitarian, who would, therefore you are against Christianity. You are, so, you are, if you're a humanist and you're a humanitarian doctor doing certain things and so on. So I, I think we, we've lost then that sense of that broad 18th century universality, cosmopolitanism, which at least in the case of Berg was quite, quite genuine, if not in other uh, thinkers who were uh, other people who, who blew trouble in France, <laughs> uh, the Jacobins and so on. They, they spoke about the universal uh, brotherhood of man one while they were actually uh, killing each other is what Burke would say, <laughs> and which was what I would also uh, uh, agree quite vehemently with a double amen. I've turned conservative, by the way, these days, <laughs> as you can sense, because of Burke. <laughs> it was a joke. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, other question? Any question or any comment is okay, I think. Uh, if, if no one's asking questions, then can I? ask you one more question Dr. Yes, Jim. I mean, uh, uh, I mean uh, on the slide you show us today uh, the contents mm -hmm. of gentlemen's magazine mm -hmm. uh, 
And uh, is there a possibility to read that slide from the perspective of mm -hmm. post-colonial discourse? I mean, uh, so the early form of uh, periodicals, uh, were, were they functioning to deliver the news from the colonies or, um, I mean, first of all, uh, the, the contents show us that the factual kind of narrative news mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the foreign countries or people desire to want to hear what's happening outside mm -hmm. of England. Mm -hmm. And, and in, well, that's um, first impression. I read mm -hmm. that slide from the slide contents of the Gentleman's Magazine. Okay. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it was called Gentleman's Magazine, mm -hmm. not for everyone. So <laughs> in terms of the rise of the novel, the early novels uh, like such as Evelina or Tristram mm -hmm. Shandy's story were um, considered to be feminized story or mm -hmm. well, the novels were things to read for women, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. magazine or the early form of periodicals were, were they kind of a reaction to that kind of uh, like readership, mm -hmm. like men read the factual things and the women mm -hmm. <laughs> read mm -hmm. all these uh, kind of all 100% okay. fake story or romance novel? Mm -hmm. Like, do you, do you see the possibility of reading uh, of my uh, okay. understanding of your slide? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's something which uh, the contemporaries would want to point out. I mean, the women never read the serious stuff. They don't read history and philosophies. They just read romances. And, uh, and surely, I mean, uh, the Gentleman's Magazine has a clearly masculine gender marked into it. But uh, gender was perhaps less important than the than status and class at the time, because uh, the, the readers were all uh, uh, merchants mostly who lacked any classical education. So uh, the, they wanted to uh, pass themselves off, uh, pretend they were gentlemen, which they weren't. So when you read this magazine, magazine actually means a collection of all, of all kinds of weaponry and so on. This will uh, arm you, this will strengthen you to, uh, to, to pretend to at least join the more gentlemanly conversation into coffee houses. And so on. So uh, the first part of that, the, what, what made Gentleman's Magazine so successful was it's uh, these uh, digest of other various essays and so on. So they were freely uh, scooping things from other publications, they were collecting it. So a monthly magazine would collect all the weekly periodicals and annual register later would, would collect all these things, but including the weekly and the monthly. So there was something of a predatory uh, and a pyramid here. So, so on, and that was considered to be legally uh, acceptable by, by the current uh, standards of uh, notions of property, of intellectual property at the time. So uh, I would be very, I would perhaps be wary to go into this issue of gender. You know? <laughs> One has to be very careful these days. But uh, I'll be teaching uh, Evelina this coming semester, so you are, you are welcome to join my course. And uh, surely not, not many women would have been interested in the list of uh, these things in the price list of commodities, prices of goods and stocks, uh, and list of bankrupts, simply because they were excluded from this world of economy, a world of interest and power. And uh, they would be more interested in marriage and romance because that's surely the one real field of uh, society where they they could make they had some 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 degree of a free choice in contrast to these things. So uh, as far as the gender side of the issue is concerned, I mean the whole uh, publishing world of the 18th century was heavily. Uh, sort of steer it heavily skewered towards the, the masculine side. I can't really deny that at all. But considering that, it's it's quite wonderful to see how uh, women were already uh, setting up their own periodicals, like Eliza Haywood, she had her own kind of periodicals and uh, they were professional writers so like Afroban and others. So uh, the, the anonymity of uh, the, the publishing world of 18th century allowed these women to take part as not simply as consumers, but also as producers. And that's something which we certainly can uh, consider to be a, 
rather more salutary positive side of uh, the publishing culture of the period, the anonymity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh uh, please, please, uh, please begin. What? Um, yeah, no, just just picking up a, a short comment. I'm sure others will will know much more about it than 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 me. But I, I think in the last few years, there's been a a lot of work on. Um, shall we say the the consumption and of different types of literature mm -hmm. and patterns of of reading? I mean, in the British case, the sort of Anglo Scottish, especially. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of somebody like Mark Towsey at mm -hmm. Liverpool, and uh, he, you know he's written very extensively on the, the consumption of the Scottish mm -hmm. Enlightenment and things like that. Mm -hmm. And what you actually do find, of course, is that th th there is a very very large uh, uh, female readership. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are attempts. Obviously, there there are, there are certain types of publications which are explicitly aimed at women, but more broadly speaking, even things like histories, you know, pro probably as, as Hadrian was pointing towards, of, of course, there would be a important, uh, you know, sort of class status stratification there, but it, it would be very common, wouldn't it? And I, I assume in continental Europe as well, France, you know, the world of salons and so on, you, you could basically presume that the Duchess of whatever would be widely read, would have read Hume and, you know, and various 17th century and classical writers and so on. And, and there are lots of accounts, you can find people's diaries, you know, I went to dinner with, you know, my Lord such and such, and we discussed, you know, Robertson's, you know, so so, so I think there's a lot of, you know, different kinds of, of methodology or, or, or work, I think, you know, that the aspects of, of kind of gender and patterns of consumption and, mm -hmm. and so on. There's, there's a lot being done on that now. So a, mm -hmm. a lot of good, um, mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, can I? Okay, please, please. All right. Uh, I want, wanted to uh, thank Professor Yoon uh, for this fascinating paper before we close. And uh, I don't know much about the period, uh, so it's just a very simple question, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and I thought it's fascinating that uh, Bok uh, wrote this kind of new genre, because mm -hmm. news is usually about the present and then history is about the past. Mm -hmm. But he was writing about uh, almost to uh, the present, the, mm -hmm. the previous year, and then he called it uh, a history. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was thinking, I had the same question with uh, Professor Paul Tongs mm -hmm. about the readership and about the um, um, printing industry mm -hmm. of, the, of the time. And then I was thinking that maybe uh, in this period of time, there was uh, some kind of demand uh, for some comprehensive knowledge because mm -hmm. this was the time when uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson also mm -hmm. compiled the dictionary mm -hmm. and also uh, Diderot, uh, his encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, yeah, thinking maybe this um, project of annual mm -hmm. register mm -hmm. can be related to kind of cultural circumstances. Oh, sure, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lim. Uh, there, there was really this demand for these encyclopedias or compendiums, collections of information, and that isn't, and it's really the British once again before the French because Chambers' encyclopedia really showed the model for the French encyclopedia and so on, and the people were buying all kinds of compendiums and encyclopedias and collections of knowledges for its own sake, and I'm sure uh, they were read quite avidly by many members of the household and they would of course would be large section of the household would be the female members so uh, the readership by no means would be confined to the to the men to the gentlemen and so on and of course uh, john as you point out samuel johnson's dictionaries was a bestseller so they were very keen to know about their own mother tongue because uh, and the very kind of uh, perhaps the physical aura of the huge dictionaries or encyclopedias, I'm sure would have appealed very much to them as, as perhaps parts of the domestic, a part of the furniture. So we have these books which carry, and uh, and I, I assume that the popularity of the French encyclopedia has very much to do with its physicality. So you you, you have this collection of encyclopedia, and without actually having read in the, in the, the whole thing, uh, you somewhat felt uh, knowable, you, you also felt enlightened, informed, 
and sort of felt philosophical if you had these things, just as, as you, we would do so in carrying and in, in browsing the Google. So it was really the Google of the 18th century, which made people uh, rather happy or made them perhaps a pompous or vain or deluded, making them forget their own human misery and their human limitations kind of hubris of enlightenment with all these uh, tragic consequences in the French Revolution and beyond. That's, that's really me rather than Burke, but, uh, but Burke really uh, says something quite similar at least in his reflections on the French Revolution front. Uh, the sense that you can know everything is something which is quite, uh, not, which goes beyond human, human capacity. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, this might be the last question or someone last comment. I hope so. I'm really exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and, Have pity, my yes, friends. Also, yes, yes, and uh, if uh, Maria Pagan, uh, if you have uh, any information on the next conference of the uh, on for the International Adam Smith Society uh, at Uni Un United States. Uh. Right. Um, thanks for, um, for, for announcing it. Um, the announcement will be coming out in March. Um, mm -hmm. So um, hopeful, hopefully you will be receiving it and uh, hopefully there will be a chance to meet in person if uh, possible. Thanks so much. Okay, and the next conference, uh, International Adventist Society's next conference is on the United States. So uh, in, in uh, I think, in October? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, please, please. Yes, yes, it will be in October um, in uh, Wisconsin. Yeah. And in United States. So some of you might, uh, including Japanese, might not be able to attend that. The, uh, face-to-face -face meeting, but at least some of you, uh, all of you, could, can uh, able to uh, so are able to attend at the online uh, online uh, conference. So, uh, if you uh, uh, would like to in attend at the meeting and give a presentation, it will be uh, welcomed. And uh, anyway. Thank you for your nice and excellent lecture, Hi, Dr. Hai Jung-Yoon. And also, thank you for the excellent comment or by discussants and all of you. Thank you so much. It's thank you very much, thank you. Yes. It's time to finish now, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。<laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.